Okay, I'm going to start the class. I apologize for the uh, starting late. Uh, in the background here, you will see a... Oh, actually, you can't even see it because of the light. Oh, dear. Um, hmm. Well, I don't really want you to watch it anyway. What I want you to note is that the actors... This, is an, uh, this was a, a depiction at the Royal Shakespeare Company here in Stratford back in 1957, though. Um, and uh, the actors are all wearing masks, um, which is an interesting thing to do in a modern-day theater, totally uh, unnecessary for the purposes of amplification, but uh, trying to present a play that would be a little bit closer to the way in which the original would be presented, but with uh, significant numbers of actors. You can't even see a thing with that. Let me see if I can... I'm going to turn it off because otherwise you'll watch that and not listen to me. But uh, I'll post this link to the website if you want to watch the play. A play is meant to be performed and seen. So we're reading it, and obviously it's a different experience. But if you take what I said already, let me blank this just to remove all uh, distractions. Uh, if you take what I said earlier, this drama is... Um, there's not a lot of action in the sense of on-stage um, spectacle. It is dramatic in the sense that it is words that lead to actions. And the actions are the main um, purpose of this particular drama. A, a characters, uh, the character on stage is led by, by his character to perform a particular action. And that particular action is the, is the subject of our observation. So the, the epic gave us narrative. There's a lot of narrative, a lot of storytelling by Homer. And he was telling us a story of, of a great man, Odysseus, who did things that are worthy of remembrance and expected us to learn lessons from that through mimesis, representation, imitation, imitating Odysseus in his, uh, in his mind and in his... Uh, uh, comportment and in his character. Likewise, on stage here, we're also seeing actions, but the focus is on the actions because there's movement on the stage. There's no narrative. The narrator, which appears here at the beginning, is very short. I mean, what does it say here at the beginning even? Does it even have, does it have anything? Yes, yeah, scene. In front of the palace of Oedipus at Thebes, to the right of stage near the altar stands the priest with a crowd of children. Oedipus emerges from the central door. And then after that, we have a whole series of speeches. Just one speech after that is dialogue. So it's language that is spoken through performers in which we don't see the faces of the individuals, but we hear their words, and it's the words that matter. Not what we see, but what we hear. Now this, this is intimately connected with action also for Aristotle, who, as I said, regards this particular play as the best example of a tragedy, and the tragedy as the most important type of uh, poetic production. And there's something about the influence of that view, Aristotle being the sort of the founder of classicism, the, the classical way of looking at human nature, which connects uh, our, our thoughts and our words to our human nature. And this becomes very important once we come into Christology, that is the theory of, uh, or the theology related to who Christ is, because Jesus is the Logos of God. The Word of God. And we, we see Jesus primarily through his speech, but also through his actions. And his speech and his actions are unified. Unlike the, uh, the Pharisees who speak and whose actions contradict what they say, Jesus has an integrity between word and action. So there's a strong emphasis in the classical period prior to Christianity of something that Christianity is going to make extraordinarily strong emphasis of, even stronger than the uh, classical age, because they're going to say that God himself takes on flesh. The word became flesh and dwelled amongst us, and we've seen his glory full of grace and truth. Now, when John writes that, John has seen him in person, 
However, he's speaking to an audience in, his, in the scriptures who have never seen him. They're not going to be able to be called apostles because they're not eyewitnesses of uh, Jesus and his earthly bodies. However, they will see him when they hear about what he's done and when they believe in him. There's a sense in which you know Jesus more intimately through the word than you do if you saw him face to face. There are many people who saw Jesus face to face in his lifetime and yet denied who he was. Even though they could see it, they had empirical evidence. Today, people ask for empirical evidence of things. In his day, they had a lot of empirical evidence that he was who he said he was, and yet they denied that he was what he claimed to be, namely God, in their presence. And this is God acting in history and so forth. So there, I think there's a strong, uh, this is a providential, in my opinion, a providential working of the classical tradition such that God is preparing the Greek mind, the Western mind, to uh, emphasize the importance of the incarnation and specifically of the importance of language in that. And this is why I think the uh, study of literature is so important in a Christian liberal arts college, Christian university, uh, because there is a strong emphasis on the word. We're all about words and words matter. Um, in our day, they don't seem to matter. They don't seem to have a lot of, um, people are careless with their words. They speak carelessly. Um, there was a time when uh, in Canadian public life, I know because I grew up in it, when people didn't swear that much. Um, they use all sorts of pejorative language. Um, we call natives Indians. Um, I don't even know what we call black people, actually. I had black friends. We didn't, I didn't use pejorative language, but you, you know the N-word, stuff like that. We, I never, we, we never said that. But still, it's there. But those sorts of identity group uh, words, these days are absolutely forbidden. You may not use those words. You can't use that, right? Back when I grew up, we called Italians, I'm not even going to give you the whole list. There's a whole list of different groups, different nationalities, and all with slang words for describing those people. And we use them all the time, and nobody blinks. I mean, if it sort of bugs you, but it doesn't go particularly deep. And yet swearing was regarded as something you did off the school campus and so forth that you don't do in the public square. Nowadays, you can't use any of those uh, identity group marking words. You, it's, you cannot use them at all. And yet I hear F-bombs everywhere. So there's something that's happened in the, sh in the shifting of language so that we think that those grouping, those words that we use to identify groups based on visible characteristics is more important than our moral nature, which is when we swear. There's a, there's a moral component. There's a sense of, of, of vulgarity, which is why you use the word to shock, right? It's the F-bomb. Uh, I simply note that because I wanted to say something about language here and how it's used. It has shifted over the course of my lifetime. I'm in my 50s. Uh, it's not that I don't know the words. I grew up with words all around me. I was uh, just like, ever but nowadays I hear people in authority using them on television, uh, in media, in, in government, academics, sometimes cool pastors want to show that they know bad words. Wow. Aren't you cool? Um, a general degradation of uh, language in connection with morality. We're happy to do that, and yet we won't tolerate basic, uh, that's because we've reduced human nature uh, and moved it away from language and connected it more with identity groups. Now there's a deep problem with that that I'm not gonna get into here because that's, it's too big a topic and it's too off topic here. Simply, it's simply to point out that language is important. Um, and truth is connected with language. Jesus is the logos of God. He is also the way, the truth, and the life. And logos is connected to logic. Probably obviously, even if you don't know Greek. The word logic comes from logos. And so along with the word is a reasoning. So there's a rational way of looking at life that allows you to distinguish truth from falsehood. And this is essential to Christian behavior. If we want to be not only 
uh, conform to the pattern of this world, as it says in Romans 12 too, but transformed by the renewal of our minds, then we're going to have to distinguish truth, truth from falsehood. That means we're going to have to use language correctly, not just the way it is used popularly, where you need to be able to think about it. Um, that's my challenge to you here in first year English, is to start to think about developing the, th the thing that you came here to do, or even if you didn't come here to do, I'm going to give you what you didn't come here to do, and maybe you'll like what you didn't know you were coming here to do, and end up valuing the thing you had no idea you were getting into. Um, but that's what I'm qualified to do, is to teach you in those ways. And I think they are valuable. And the university is uniquely suited to doing that. But this uh, play, Oedipus, is all about identity. I said that last time. And the identity is specifically related to Oedipus. As I said last time, there's a little bit of a play on his name. It could be Oedipu, who am I? This is a man who claims to, or, or demonstrates, that he has solved the riddle of the Sphinx. So he's a wise man, and yet he has no idea who he e even is. He doesn't know his own identity. So there's something very ironic about this play, which Aristotle says is about human nature, furthermore. It's not just about Oedipus. He says that it's a, it's a teaching in the action of the drama of Oedipus Rex, we have some sort of profound teaching on human nature. And I can tell you in the ancient world, this is a, a, a live issue, one of the uh, cynics uh, Diogenes went through the streets with a lamp up high right in the middle of the day, sunny day Athens, you can imagine what it's like, glaring sunlight, with a lamp lit. And he's walking around, people ask him, what are you doing? And he said, I'm, I'm trying to see if I can find a man. And he's obviously a, a joker in some ways, but he, he is embodying, now he, he's embodying a certain attitude to uh, a philosophical attitude to the problem of people living their lives, which is they don't even know who they are. They don't know who they are and they're trying to solve the riddle of the world and yet they have not solved the riddle that is most important, which is who are they? Like what does it mean to be a human being? And what does it mean to live a worthy human life? Clearly human beings are different than animals because we're bothered by such questions. We, the fact that we ask such questions distinguishes us. I have a cat at home, I love my cat. My cat looks out the window all the time, he looks deep in thought, he is not deep in thought. <laughs> that, is, that animal is not deep in thought. <laughs> we like to think he is every once in a while, we imagine him and we, we talk on his behalf and whatever. And he meows and, you know, he's saying something. He's not saying anything. There's no articulate speech coming from his mouth. It's a meow. He has different meows. Okay. But, I mean, not that many. It's the I want food meow. I want to be petted meow. Whatever. Recognition when you walk in the room meow. It's a little different. But there's no articulate sound. He's not thinking about anything. He is not going to try and represent the world around him. He's not trying to express himself through art. He's not going to build anything new. There's no evolution of his mind because he doesn't have a mind, not a rational mind. He is not bothered by existential problems of the fact he's going to die. It doesn't bother him. He's afraid of death, but he's not thinking about the, uh, the atrocity that comes with that, a sense that it's wrong, a sense that there's a tragedy when a life is lost. The animals don't think about that. We have no indication that they do. We anthropomorphize them when we do that. But this play is about that, those sorts of things. It's about uh, deeply religious questions at a religious festival, Festival of Dionysus. Aristotle says that it is, says something profound about human nature and the tragedy, in a sense, teaches us the very sort of subject matter that philosophy does because it deals with universal truths. So, as I said to you, when I came to the university years ago and started studying literature, I didn't, I don't even know how I ended up in the classroom. It was just, I like to read books was about it, but I didn't want to study English. I, but when I came in to study literature, I found there's a lot more here than I expected in the tradition of literature, not the stuff we read in school, which gets worse by the year, by the way. 
but, but in the great books of the Western tradition, um, profound questions being asked. And this man, Oedipus, um, is remarkable, says Aristotle, because he illustrates something about us that we see particularly clearly because he has certain qualities. And, and one of the qualities is that he's better than us. So we sense the fall of the man because we see how high he is. This is a good man. He's a king, but he's also noble in his character. He wants to solve the problems of the city and he's willing to go to any lengths. He said, he, even if it hits his own house, he's willing to go to that length to solve the problem. And he means it and we believe it. And the crowd loves him because here's a man of integrity. So there's, the, there's irony in this play. Do you know what I, I mean by irony? He says one thing and the audience understands the opposite. Here's, and it, so they, the crowd senses, we sense. I mean, we were, you like Oedipus at first. Oh, this is a good man. He is a good man. Actually, no, he is a very, very bad man. Extraordinarily bad man. But he doesn't even know it. Christians can have a field day with this. They have no idea the depravity of sin. They think that they're upright, moral, good. In some cases, by the lights of the world, they certainly are. These are good people. But are, how, are they aware of the problem of sin? Yes, of course. Did you say that Oedipus, like, his arrogance ultimately like, that led to his downfall? Because he's like, very like, rigid about like, wanting to know the truth, right? He, he, it's not, well, arrogance is, is a good word. The word that Aristotle uses specifically, I'm going to write it down here, is hubris. Oops, that's not going to work. Try it again. That's the Greek word. It's pride. It's not arrogant. It's he thinks he's He's able. He is an aristocrat. He's also got strong character. And he's committed to the best things. He's willing to leave his family. It's not, only, it's not any man who's going to get up and leave a, a family of a, of a king and a queen and wander off to avoid doing a bad deed. He'll probably try and stay there and do it because he gets the the benefits of being in power. He's willing to leave that all behind. It's a bit like Abraham. In, in that sense, he wanders away. He walks away from his city. So he thinks. So he thinks. But in fact, he walks into the trouble that he's trying to avoid. Again, irony. There are levels of irony throughout the play. There's constant irony. One of them is his name. And this is, what, this is why it's such a, a, a profound play and, and laughable play at times. You, you're just chuckling, groaning even. Because he says things and he means them on one level and we understand them on a, a different level. In English, this used to be a characteristic of the English language, was the use of irony to say one thing and mean the opposite. That is lar largely gone in Canada now. You can't, and maybe it's because of multiculturalism, I don't know. Because irony is a difficult uh, thing to grasp uh, in a second language. You know, you want to understand the primary meaning, the, like the, the sub-meaning, that one's really hard to convey. It seems a little unfair. It's like insider baseball. Yes? Is sarcasm No, but it's often connected with it. It's not a form of irony. Sarcasm is literally the tearing of the flesh. And so that's a direct tearing. Like you're ripping somebody. Everyone knows you're ripping them. What do they call it now? Burning. <laughs> that's, that's sort of sarcasm. Ooh, you got burned, my kids say it. And that's sort of sarcasm, although it's not even usually sarcasm. It's just like, like, like <sighs> culture so dumb. It's, 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 it's aggressive and attacking. Irony is not. It's the opposite. I appear to praise you when I'm actually indicting you. 
So you can say, aren't you brilliant? Right, and with that tone, aren't you brilliant? And what everyone in the room is laughing is that I'm saying you're an idiot, right? It, 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 it's context specific then. When I say to somebody, you know, somebody says something really um, that everyone recognizes as dumb and the teacher says, what a brilliant answer. And everyone goes, oh, he meant the opposite, right? But it's a deliberate awareness on the audience's part. So there's a dramatic irony arises out of this. So the audience and this, and, and we have to add dramatic irony to this. It's dramatic irony because the audience is aware on one level what the actors are not. So there's a discrepant awareness. And this is why the play is, again, uh, profound in some ways because it's showing us that even though we go through life talking in certain ways and thinking we understand things, actually if we took a, took a step back and we could watch ourselves, we would see that it wasn't quite the way it appeared. So the, the stage is a way for us to learn in life without having to suffer all the consequences of it. It's a teaching medium. Right? Oedipus, line 50. The, the Oedipus the man, at this point in the play, right at the outside of the play, this is a man who has murdered his father and uh, has had incestuous relations with his mother, has children with him. This is his speech. I pity you, children. You have come full of longing. He's speaking to the chorus now. Come full of longing, but I have known the story before you told it only too well. I know you were all sick. Yet there is not one of you, sick though you are, that is sick as I myself. <laughs> sick in the sense of moral, he's depraved. He's, he's blighted by, there's not one of you. Now he says in the audience, is that, oh, the, this is the man Oedipus that we found in Homer's underworld, the sort of proverbial figure of depravity. He says it, and what he means is I'm, sympathizing with you, you f you're sick and because I care for you, I am more sick than you. I feel your pain. Again, there's a sort of, he's an actor. Remember the word in, um, that Jesus used of the Pharisees? He calls them hypocrites. A hypocrite's an actor. We're watching the actors on the stage. They're not intentionally hypocrites. But there is an, a, 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 an element in which we see their hypocrisy and they don't see it. Profound way of presenting it, the use of irony. It, it's, it's used here throughout. Now, I'm not going to be able to go through this exhaustively. I'm tempted to put this on. I'm going to put this on for two seconds because I'm just sort of chuckling to myself. see Oedipus there with the king's scepter and so forth and all these characters. I'll, I'll stop it now. You'll ignore me otherwise. Um, but there is a, um, in, in the tragedy, a demonstration on stage of the importance of, of action that displays something about human nature. Now, one of, the, one of the things that is essential here is that we identify with the main figure and we admire him. It's not good enough that we find ourselves, yeah, he's a nice guy, he's sympathetic. We admire him, we look up to him. And that's, the, that's where we begin, that's where the chorus begins. They are thinking this is the man, who, he, he's our savior, more or less. He's saved the city already. This is the savior. We look up to him, we want him to um, we want him to do what he alone can do. And um, he falls, though, not because of a moral fault per se, although he, there is a moral fault, which is just what I said. He murdered his father in incest with his mother. But he's not aware of that. He's not aware of that fact. But he makes an error. And I talked about this last time. And this is Aristotle's word, ahamartia. He makes a, a fatal error. And this leads him 
astray. Now, it's not a weakness of character. There's no weakness in Oedipus's character. He's a strong character. It's an error of judgment of some sort. He's judging on the basis of appearances. He, he's going on all the available information. The best man am, amongst us, uh, if he were that good, would make the same decision that Oedipus made, probably. Right? It's not a moral weakness. He doesn't have a moral weakness. He's made an error on the basis of the best knowledge that he could possibly have. And yet, nonetheless, does the worst possible thing, the very thing he's trying to avoid. Now, this in a fatalistic worldview, which is the Greek's worldview, there is no way for him to escape this. This just adds to the problem for us. There's no way that Oedipus could not do what has happened in the play. One, because it's a historical event and it's just recording that, but that, there's more than that. It's prophesied that he will do this. And then his parents, first his parents and then he, seeks to do everything in his power to seek to avoid the, the horrible deed from happening because he's that good. And his parents are that good. And yet his parents and he are committed in doing something that's that bad in trying to avoid it. And so what we end up with is the view that the, what is fated cannot be escaped for human beings. It's a terrible sense that his free will is not that free after all. It's not so free as to remove him from the problem of guilt and horrible conduct. Comment or question? Strophe and antistrophe, as I said, it's the same course, and the strophe, and it's, it's just referring to um, a turning. A strophe is a turning, and the uh, antistrophe is turning in the other way, and they're probably, as I say, sort of dancing around on stage, and they start, when they're talking, they're in the strophe, they're probably shuffling side to side and going around the circle, and then they go back the other way, and it's, so it's, it's like a dialectic moving back and forth a little bit. Yeah, maybe they're just like, maybe that's a representation of thinking on the one hand. And on the other hand, then it comes an epode. Like, that's what we do when we think. Look at both sides. They're maybe moving around. There's a dram dramatic representation of this. By the way, in the ancient world, um, Plato's known for his academy, but Aristotle is known for his Lyceum, and they walked around when they talked. And Socrates is famous in his dialogues for walking and talking. I, walking is actually quite useful when you're thinking. Not quite sure why. I don't know why. I just, it is. Let's you move. You're, you're physically moving, your mind's thinking, and it's just sort of the process of bodily movement and thinking seems to go well together. Just sitting in your cubicle in the library, uh, you seem to be going nowhere. It's helpful. Go and, and talk to somebody. The dialogue is a part of that, and, you, and it helps to have uh, you bounce your ideas off somebody, yes, especially if the person that you're talking to is a thinker and is going to push back be in a sort of, it's not an argument, it's, it's a sort of a debate. And um, historically, this is a way of teaching, but it's also a way in which the uh, Western democracy was built up through debates. Parliament's there to debate. You get one side, the government, presenting its policy, and then you get the opposition there to present a pushback on the policy as enunciated. And the point of that is that the outcome of it to get a better policy. Same thing happens in the courts of the law. You get the, the defense lawyer and you get the prosecution. The prosecution's making the case that this man's guilty for whatever reason, and the defense is saying, no, he's not. Bring the evidence for it. And at the end of that, a judgment comes out of it. So it's an oppositional thing. Now, you, know, you hear nothing good about that in our world today. It's seen as you know, argumentative and so forth. It's not argumentative. Argumentative is just the form. Sometimes people think it's referring to the, the character of the people. They're argumentative. They get you know, angry and so forth. That's not the point. The point is through words to discern the truth and falsehood of the best policy. You talk about it. It's really easy to make decisions when, you only, when one person is involved. I make a lot of very quick decisions that take a very long time to undo when somebody else points out to me how bad the decisions were. 
So that's the point. You meet together in a free council with, without, again, parliament, no consequences, free speech in parliament. Can oppose policy, you can use language to come about so that we move forward together. Come let us reason together, says God. So it's a part of the reasoning process. Now, Aristotle sees this form as one that conveys knowledge. And here it's an, a particular type of knowledge. But as I said, uh, no, I'm not going to turn that back on. Um, and it provokes in us a thoughtfulness about our very understanding of uh, human reality and how to act and how to relate to the gods because this play um, brings us in contact with the gods yet again. It's the feast festival of Dionysus, um, but fate determines it. Now this is really gonna be important. I'll say more about this when we m move forward in a couple of weeks to talk about a fatalistic worldview of the ancient world to a providential worldview, which is a Christian worldview. It's not the same thing at all. Not remotely. The fates are blind. The gods, the Olympian gods have no control over them. It's, it's necessity that rules the day. Like the animals, really. Nothing can change it. There's nothing you can do. As much as the Greeks understand the importance of reasoning and speech and freedom, they're trapped in a fatalistic universe in which speech and freedom and action actually don't matter. They end up like Achilles in the underworld anyway. Their ideals are better than their worldview. They're trapped in a bad theology, pretty much. Uh, a providential order ha suggests that there's a God outside the created order who is omnipotent and is able to intervene and change things. You can appeal to that God and he has the power to get involved in the created order and change things. Sometimes we call them miracles, but often we just see it as a, a, a less obvious ordering of events. Hence we pray because there's a personal God to whom we can pray. They pray here as well, but the gods can't change anything. They can't change what's faded. No power. Not the same thing at all. So the, the, as I say, the, I like to see the ancient world, um, the one that we're looking at for the next few weeks, as creating the terms of engagement. These are the, this is how the conversation begins. They give us the terms uh, in which we can start thinking about these things. Christ, Christians will come along and perfect what the classical age bequeathed to them comes at just the right time. I'll say about, more about that right now. Um, but where do we want to go with this? Um, so the story is uh, revealed very slowly and uh, rather extraordinarily. And what we find is that Oedipus um, becomes more belligerent as time goes by because he starts hearing things that he doesn't like and doesn't believe. And, and the chief point of conflict, at least the first point of conflict, is when he pulls before him the figure that we've already mentioned of Tiresias. So he calls on Tiresias because Tiresias is a prophet, don't you know? And he is re reputed for his wisdom and so they pull him in, and he comes in at line 300. And Oedipus says this to him, Tiresias, you are versed in everything, things teachable and things not to be spoken. Things of the heaven and earth creeping things, you have no eyes, but in your mind you know with what a plague our city is afflicted. My Lord, this is Oedipus speaking, in you alone we find a champion, in you alone one that can rescue us. Perhaps you've not heard the messengers. But Phoebus, Apollo, sent in answer to our sending an oracle declaring that our freedom from this disease would only come 
when we should learn the names of those who killed King Laius and kill them or expel them from our country. Do not begrudge us oracles from birds or any other way of prophecy within your skill. Save yourself and the city. Save me. Redeem the debt of our pollution that lies on us because of this dead man. We are in your hands. Pains are most nobly taken to help another when you have means and power. The pollution, words, the, word, the word used here is miasma. It's a moral stain. It's not just a disease. There's something more here. The gods are punishing us. It's not just a physical disease. By the way, the Greeks, just like um, the Christian age, connected disease, famine, plagues with God's judgment. These things are not just biological phenomena. They're, they're a sign of judgment. The Bible's unequivocal about it. Right? There, there is a connection between disease and judgment. It's not incidental. It, it's not individual per se. It's, it's more of a national scale. A plague comes to a nation. Signs of judgment. Uh, obvious places in the Exodus narrative where there are plagues. Right, as, as signs of judgment. Uh, and so there's a moral attribute to a physical illness, which, uh, as I say, the ancient world is pretty much unanimous in. And so there is also an awareness that when there is a national disease epidemic, there's a need for repentance, perhaps on a national scale. It used to be the case that in Canada, the US, they would have calls for repentance in such instances. Didn't happen a few years back, you might have noticed. As if there was no connection between the physical problem and moral problems. But for there to be moral problems, we'd have to recognize that there was morality. And that morality was important to human nature. And as I said, the use of F-bombs everywhere suggests that there is no awareness of that. Or rather, whatever awareness is, we laugh at it. And parents will use it in front of their kids with no, without blinking. And then wonder why the kids get worse. And they'll blame the schools for it, which they're partly right in. But it's, it doesn't, it's not only there. Uh, at any rate. Uh, he appeals to Tiresias as this figure who can heal him, and Tiresias' response immediately, because he actually does know, says, Alas, how terrible is wisdom when it brings no profit to the man that's wise. This I knew well, but had forgotten it, else I would not have come here. So the immediate response of Tiresias, is line 316, is to wish that he had not been brought forward at this point to solve this problem because he knows what the problem is and it's the man in front of him. And he knows that the one thing the king does not want to hear is that the problem with the city is the king, especially when the king uh, will not accept that. Why? Because the wise king is a fool. And fools don't want to hear the truth. So Tiresias, the blind man, sees very clearly that all this is going to mean is that he is going to suffer abuse for telling the truth. And so he would rather not come. I don't want to be here. Now, this is a pagan use of the word prophet, but it carries much of the same weight that we find in the Old Testament use of prophets. There, a prophet is a navar of the, uh, those that bear a burden. Prophets are not happy people. They're grumpy because <laughs> they get a lot of abuse. For telling the truth, they're going to get beaten and reviled, and prophets are never part of the establishment. They're always outside the city. You have to go in the wilderness to find them. It's when the city goes down and when their culture is crushed that the prophets come forward. And they only come forward because only at that point, when there's no wisdom left in the city, you go outside the city and find the prophets there. Uh, Tiresias does not want to be here, and he knows how this is going to play out, He's going to be pushed to tell what he does not want to tell. Because Oedipus says, I want the truth. And Tiresias effectively says, you can't handle the truth. 
you, you do not want the truth. That is the last thing you want. And Oedipus, and this is the irony, and this is part of the humor of it, Oedipus is outraged because he thinks that the reason Tiresias won't tell him is because he's a coward. That's the only reason. He fears consequences. What sort of wimp are you? I mean, man up. Just tell the truth. Be a good man. So he sees it on one level. He's judging falsely the reason why the prophet won't speak as well. I'll read on. So Tiresias says, oh, I wish I'd never come here. Oedipus, what is this? How sad you are now you've come. Let me go home, says Tiresias. It will be easiest for us both to bear our several destinies to the end if you will follow my advice. Oedipus, you'd rob us of, of this your gift of prophecy? You talk as one who had no care for law nor love for Thebes who reared you. Yes, but I see that even your own words miss the mark. Hamartia, they miss the mark, even your own words. Therefore, I must fear for mine. For God's sake, if you know of anything, do not turn from us. All of us kneel to you. All of us here, your suppliants, all of you here know nothing. I will not bring to the light of day my troubles, mine, rather than call them yours. Oedipus, what do you mean? You know of something but refuse to speak. Would you betray us and destroy the city? I will not bring this pain upon us both, neither on you nor on myself. Why is it you question me and waste your labor? I will tell you nothing. You would provoke a stone. Tell us, you villain. Tell us and do not stand there quietly unmoved and balking at the issue. You blame my temper, but you do not see your own that lives within you. It is me you chide. Who would not feel his temper rise at words like these with which you shame our city? Of themselves, things will come, though, although I hide them and breathe no word of them. Since they will come, tell them to me. So there's just a back and forth, just push, 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 and here's a man that won't be pushed. He will not tell him. And it gets increasingly belligerent. And Oedipus becomes, as I say, uh, the hubris of the man is, is evident here a little bit, a little bit, but he's oblivious to it. He thinks he has a man who's weak and who's, who's not willing to take the consequences of his own actions, of his speech. He's not willing to take it. That's not the issue. It's much deeper than that. And he's oblivious to the whole episode. But the audience is aware of what's going on because again, I say to you, and, and, and the full effect of this is not obvious to you because you've read this for the first time. And you don't know the story of who Oedipus was before he came to the classroom, I trust. And the story of ancient Thebes and the story of incest is new to you. But for the Greek audience, uh, Sophocles is not making up a story that they don't know. They know this, this story. It's a legend. It's a legend to the Greeks. They all know it. What makes this a great play is his telling of the story. It's the way he presents it and the way he puts the emphasis that makes it the great drama. It's not the inventiveness of the tale. The, story, the details of the story are well known. As I say, I say that because in our day, a, a good drama is one which is very surprising. We don't know where it's going to go, and there's a little, you know, a real twist in the tale right at the end. Oh, I didn't expect that. You never get this in the ancient world. You always know how it's going to end. The story's already known. Yes? Hubris directly related with the, like, his oblivion? Like yes. He's blind, okay. not physically, yes. clearly. That's Tiresias. But he's blind to the whole uh, moral, uh, effective moral, the moral dimensions of actions. And would you say it's the hubris leading that blindness? <laughs> That's part of it for sure. Okay. But it's hubris on his part to think that he could avoid what the gods have decreed. Who do, who do you think you are? You get, the gods have decreed that this is what's going to happen, and you're going to avoid that? Like, it's been fated. Apollo's furious 
because you've not just because you've done such a bad thing, but because you think that you can avoid what's faded. Nobody can avoid what's faded, not even the gods. And here we have a man who has free will, thinking that he can do whatever he wants and avoid consequence, even though the gods have said it. Are you smarter than the gods? His parents tried to avoid it. Why did they try to avoid it? Is it because they thought they were smarter than the gods? Or is it because what was prophesied was so heinous that they would do anything to avoid that happening? And that is the latter. That's why. Of course they would try and avoid this. Do you really want to do that? And nobody wants to do that. Even a bad person wouldn't want to do that. So of course they tried to avoid it. So there's hubris in the very idea, and yet the very idea leads them to the outcome. And Aristotle says that this teaches us something about human nature. And I think he's right, because I think it really reveals something about sin. Though the word hamartia, missing the mark, is, doesn't have the uh, connotations in the Greek here that it does in Scripture. In Scripture, it's a moral missing of the mark, moral dimensions. But moral dimensions are, are in play here, for sure. But that's not, he just, he doesn't see it. Yes? In his own eyes. Oedipus. He doesn't know better. Yeah. And, and actually what the scriptures say on this is entirely correct. Everybody thinks they're doing the right thing. Actually, it's not entirely true. Just t sometimes people do wrong things and they know they're wrong. Yeah, but in his case, we see where yeah. Totally yeah. 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 And then, so this is the problem for the religious teachers in general and the good people. The good people uh, are upright and they tend to think that they don't do wrong to anybody else. And Jesus, those are the people that Jesus particularly blasts because they think that they're exempt. We can see who the immoral people are. There's a prostitute, there's a drunkard, there's a whatever, there's an adulterer. We can see that. They're, they're the bad people. We're not those people. We can, we're, we're right in our own eyes. He goes to the scribe and the Pharisees, one of whom prays and gives thanks that he's not like those people. <laughs> right? Yes. Before. Yep. Yes. This will be in the fourth century BC. To our, to our knowledge, there's no awareness of this in Greece uh, of the Hebrew scriptures, although I, I have said that Plato's philosophy suggests an acquaintance with uh, the Old Testament. Plato comes after this, but it's around the same time. But I'll, I'll say more about that when we look at Plato's Republic. Yes? So is it be it's because he's too quick to judge? His swiftness. He does seem like that way, right? Um, and the other thing you might have noticed, and, and you're right about the sense of being in a hurry, is those instances, are in, in terms of the way this is written, are when the dialogue is starting to get heated. The speeches get shorter and shorter. And you can see just through the, and this is when you're in an argument, you don't give me a big long speech because the person that's angry at you is not gonna let you finish that speech. You get a word in. And then the word comes back, and it's bank, 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 right? And that quick interaction uh, conveys to the audience that the people are losing their temper a little bit and are speaking without thinking. And Oedipus is, is pushed, even though he's the wise, wise Oedipus, and I think he probably is in some ways, but this, the situation pushes him to act very foolishly and speak foolishly. You're correct. That's a good observation. Yes? Would you say that Jocasta went into his blind as well in terms of marrying her son? And it's an extraordinary one, right? Yeah. Because she, she is less, um, 
uh, it's easier to sympathize with Oedipus than it is with her. Like she knew she was destined to marry her son. She knew that, and, and she had the son and sent him off. Right. So you would have thought when your husband dies that you, like, there might be a light bulb that goes on, first of all. <laughs> and then an ex man that comes in that sort of looks a lot like your ex-husband, yeah. that maybe, just the thought, right. you might, you know, because she knew the whole story and he, he didn't even know it. Right. So we don't, we feel more sympathy, but no, it's not about Jocasta. It's not the tragedy of Jocasta. Right. It's the tragedy of Oedipus. Because at Jocasta, we have even less, like she's more culpable, really. She ought to have known. Would you say negligent is the word? Yeah. Good, sure. More, more negligent, yes, I would, for sure. She has more knowledge, so of course. But we're not focused on her, and the play's not focused on her, and Sophocles isn't interested in her as the primary figure. He's interested in, interested in Oedipus, who represents us. Because it, and it, th actually it's just such a great point because then you could think, well, why isn't it? Because this is a figure of greater guilt because Oedipus reflects more the human, human nature in general, which is we often get caught up in doing things without any advanced knowledge and yet we still do wrong things. I mean, could be part of it. But it's a great, it's a great observation. She is definitely more complicit in the whole thing and we probably ought to judge her harshly. Jocasta does, ends up, well, how does she end up? You've read this play, how does she end up? She kills herself. Oedipus doesn't do that. He, le he le exits the play like the man he describes as the uh, solution to the riddle of the Sphinx. He goes off stage with a cane. He's blinded and he goes off tapping. He gouges his own eyes out with brooches that are holding up his thing. He goes off stage and he gouges his eyes out. Now he doesn't do it on stage, he does it off stage. The Greeks regard it as reprehensible to show violence on the stage. They thought it was degrading to the audience, which it is, by the way. Watching violence is degrading. It corrupts the people that watch it. It's not that they are not aware of violence. They get into violent conflicts all the time. They're in wars all the time. But watching it on stage, there's something about it that is traumatizing. Like trauma is literally a wound. You can cause trauma to somebody by blunt force trauma, but you can also do it by watching. It has, still has an effect on you. My kids watch violence on screen. They say, oh, I'm all right. When I say, you know, I'm okay. You're not okay, actually. You, you're saying that because you put a brave face on it, but actually, I know you're not okay because I've watched this and it affects me. I'm not saying I'm, I'm traumatized by it, to use the psychological language, but it is watching violence causes a sort of wound. Now, there's a way, no way of avoiding it, per se. Traumas come with life. But being close to them makes you focus on the trauma and not on the teaching there. And the, the Greeks want us to focus on the wisdom that's taught and not to be distracted by the, por the, the porn violence. Right? You know, our, like the, the video games and stuff like that, excessively violent. Strong correlation between uh, psychotropic medicine and super violent video games and serial killers. Strong correlation. It's not causation, because not everyone does, but strong correlations, yes. Um, things for mental, it's prescribed for mental illness. Yeah. Like they're, me they're messing with certain things, right? They're messing, they're regulating. They can have side effects. Nobody ever talks about, they always talk about the guns. You know, if we just got rid of the guns, this wouldn't happen. If only it were that simple. I mean, there, you can make a case for getting rid of the guns, but, but that's not gonna solve the problem there. The problem is that everyone else has the guns, and they don't use the guns, but this person does. What, what is it that leads this person to that? And you can see a strong correlation there, often. Um, not much talked about, because that presents an, a much more complex problem then. 
and much more soul searching would go on at that point. Anyway, um, so vi violence is traumatic. Watching violence is traumatic. And we can't, yet we can't avoid trauma. So how do we deal with trauma? We present it off stage. <laughs> you do it off stage, you have him come on and he comes on with a blindfold on and they're red where his eyes were and so you can see that it's happened. But you didn't have to watch him literally eyes popping out of his head or some horrible thing. Like today they'd do a close up CGI and you'd see blood splattering everywhere and so forth. Is that necessary? Not necessary at all. You, can get, you get the idea. Because the point is to create a, a sense of uh, wisdom in the audience. The other is just exciting them with violence. There's a reason why people like violent sports. Who doesn't like blood sports? I do. And like fighting? Sure, men like it anyway, some women, anyway, some people don't, but whatever. The reason they do, they, we like violence. Most people that don't like violence don't like it because they're not, they think that they're gonna be on the end of it, but they're happy to dish it out if they can. It's product of sin to some degree. Um, but this, this uh, tragedy gives us a higher knowledge than history itself, says Aristotle once again. It gives us a sort of awareness of universal uh, universals in the same way philosophy does. So Aristotle gives this a very high praise and it purges pity and fear in the audience. I can talk about that later. But so this interaction bet between Tiresias and Oedipus leads to uh, Tiresias leaving and um, Creon coming in, accusing, uh, Oedipus accuses Tiresias of being set up by his brother-in-law. Creon, who would be the one who would probably come into, the, into power if he weren't there, so he's speculating the reason Tiresias won't tell him the truth is because his brother-in-law is plotting against him to overthrow him. And so when he calls Creon in, Tiresias says, Creon is no hurt to you, but you are to yourself. Now that's only going to incite Oedipus with anger. Like, but it's not clear to Oedipus what he means by that but he's just blaming, like I'm attacking you, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you back in turn. You're saying, no you're, no, you're the problem. No, you're the problem, like that, that's how he takes it. That's not what's going on. But again, he, that's what he's imagining. It's just a push in the chest type stuff. Oedipus then gives a great long speech. The chorus comes in and says this, 404. We look at this man's words, says the chorus, uh, Tiresias, and yours, my king, and we find both have spoken them in anger. We need no angry words, but only thought how we may best hit the God's meaning for us. Tiresias speaks, and now a long speech. If you are king, at least I have the right no less to speak in my defense against you. Of that much I am master. I am no slave of yours, but Loxius, and so I shall not enroll myself with Creon for my patron. Since you have taunted me with being blind, here is my word for you. You have your eyes, but see not where you are in sin, nor where you live, nor whom you live with. Do you know who your parents are? Unknowing you are an enemy to kith and kin in death, beneath the earth and in this life. A deadly-footed, double-striking curse from father and mother both shall drive you forth out of this land with darkness on your eyes that now have such straight vision. Shall there be a place will not be harbor to your cries, a corner of Kitharon will not ring in echo to your cries soon, soon, when you shall learn the secret of your marriage, which steered you to a haven in this house. Haven, no haven, after lucky voyage. And of the multitude of other evils establishing a grim equality between you and your children, you know nothing. What's the grim equality? His children are his brothers and sisters. It's a grim equality. So muddy with contempt, my words and creons, misery shall grind no man as it will you. 
So he's, he's prophesying about how this is all going to end up. You're going to drive your, you're going to be driven out of the city. Blind. You are blind. So it's, it's actually for the audience, what he said is abundantly clear. Like it, it's almost a literal, he means every word of what he said literally. But Oedipus takes it to be figurative, all figurative and not applying to him. It is, is it endurable that I should bear such words from him? Go and a curse go with you. Quick, home with you, out of my house at once. I would not have come either had you not called me. <laughs> out he goes. So out he goes. Creon comes in, makes the accusation, and there's a slow revelation about details of the past. Creon will say something, they'll send a messenger to try and find out what happened on the road, etc. And they're trying to, it's like a mystery, and trying to get to the bottom of the mystery. And gradually they send out messengers and messengers come back. And as they come back, they come back with details that are going to enlighten them to the situation in front of them. And the audience who is aware of the enormity of the trauma that's been caused and how it's been caused and who it's been caused by is slowly matched by Oedipus himself, who begins claiming to know everything, even though he knows nothing. And by the end, when he knows, when he knows everything, blinds himself and leaves the stage. And the audience watching the whole spectacle knows that in some ways, it's not just a play about Oedipus. And that's what's so spellbinding about it. Anyway, Jocasta comes in and has conversation with Oedipus. And I will skip over that. I'll come with the messenger. The messenger um, comes in, 925. Might I learn from you, sirs, where is the house of Oedipus? Or best of all, if you know, where is the king himself? Chorus. This is his house, and he is within doors. This lady is his wife and mother of his children. God bless you, lady, and God bless your household. God bless Oedipus's noble wife. Again, the audience it, it is aware that his wife's not noble. And it, again, the irony throughout the whole play, it's strong. God bless you, sir, for your kind greeting. What do you want of us? that you have come here. What have you come to tell me? Good news, lady, good for your house and for your husband. What is your news? Who sent you to us? I come from Corinth, and the news I bring will give you pleasure, perhaps a little pain too. What is this news of double meaning? The people of the Isthmus will choose Oedipus to be their king. That is the rumor there. Because remember, he left Corinth. That's where he grew up. He was adopted by the king and queen of Corinth. And his mother and father are now dead. And so they're looking for the son, the prince. And the messengers are going to find him and bring him back to be the king of Corinth. So that's the story. But isn't their king still old Polybus? No, he is in the grave. Death has got him. Is that the truth? Is Oedipus's father dead? May I die myself if it be otherwise. Jocasta to a servant, be quick and run to the king with the news. O oh, oracles of the gods, where are you now? It was from this man Oedipus fled, lest he should be his murderer. And now he's dead in the course of nature and not killed by Oedipus. Enter Oedipus, dearest Jocasta, why have you sent for me? Listen to this man and when you hear, Reflect what is the outcome of the holy oracles of the gods. Jocasta is, is guilty of not just hubris here, she's blaspheming. Like the, the gods declared this and it hasn't come to pass. She's mocking. Oedipus, who is he? What is his message for me? He is from Corinth and he tells us that your father Polybus is dead and gone. What's this you say, sir? Tell me yourself. Since this is the first matter you want clearly told, Polybus has gone down to death. You may be sure of it. By treachery or sickness, a small thing will put old bodies asleep. 
So he died of sickness, it seems. Poor old man. Yes, and of age, the long years he had measured. Ha ha! Oh dear Jocasta, why should one look to the Pythian hearth? The Pythian is the Delphic oracle. Pythian Apollo, Pythos, the of uh, spear of the Python, mentioned in, uh, in the book of Acts as well, where the Pythoness is. Why should we go there? And again, the Delphic Oracle is renowned throughout the ancient world as the most famous of the oracles of, of the Greeks. Why should we go there? Now, Oedipus is also mocking Apollo. Why should one look to the birds screaming overhead? They prophesied that I should kill my father, but he's dead and hidden deep in earth. And I stand here who never laid a hand on, on spear against him, unless perhaps he died of longing for me. And thus, thus I am his murderer. But they, the oracles, as they stand, he's taken them away with him. They're dead as he himself is and worthless. So here's the hubris. The gods are wrong. They've been proved wrong. Ha! That I told you before now. You did. But I was misled by my fear. Then lay no more of them to heart, not one. But surely I must fear my mother's bed. He says to his mother, Jocasta, Jocasta, why should man fear since chance is all in all for him and he can clearly foreknow nothing? Best to live lightly as one can unthinkingly. As to your mother's marriage bed, don't fear it. Before this, in dreams too, as well as oracles, many a man has lain with his own mother. But he to whom such things are nothing bears his life most easily. It's just a dream. Lots of men dream about that. Sigmund Freud underlined this in his copy of this, by the way. When he came up with the Oedipus complex, he underlined this. Many men in dreams uh, has lain with their, their own mother. I, I haven't. Just saying, but, but Freud apparently, had, well, whatever, okay, uh, comes up with a whole psychology based on it. Again, interesting that the, uh, the great tragedies and epics are read by psychologists, soci I mean, all intellectuals. They don't always come up with a theory of it related to human repression and explanations for human conduct based on repressed sexuality and sex drives and so forth, like Freud does, who's a bit of a sicko, but, but it's an influential work. And the irony to us is, is patent because Jocasta is his mother, who, who he has slept with. You don't need to worry about sleeping with because, you know, that's never going to happen. When it already has happened. All you say would be said perfectly if, if she were dead. But since she lives, I must still fear, though you talk so well, Jocasta. Now, note about Oedipus. Oedipus is still worried about doing this because he has enough fear of the gods which makes him a better man than his mother. His mother has no fear. Why? Because she has learned from experience that it, although the gods prophesied that her baby was going to kill her husband and sleep with her, they got rid of the baby. The baby's dead as far as she's concerned. So of course the gods aren't always right. Right? She has good reason. If, if she's correct in thinking the baby's dead, now... The problem is the baby is not dead. Still in your father's death, there's light of comfort. Great light of comfort, but I fear the living. Who's the woman that makes you afraid? Merope, old man, Polybus' wife. What about her frightens the queen in you? A terrible oracle stranger from the gods. Can it be told, or does the sacred law forbid another to have knowledge of it? Oh no. Once on a time, Loxius said that I should lie with my own mother and take on my hands the blood of my own father. And so for these long years I've lived away from Corinth. It has been to my great happiness, but yet it's sweet to see the face of parents. This was the fear which drove you out of Corinth? Old man, I did not wish to kill my father. Why should I not free you from this fear, sir, since I have come to you in all goodwill? You would not find me thankless if you did. Why? It was just for this I brought the news, to earn your thanks when you had come safe home. No, I will never come near my parents. Son, 
it's very plain you don't know what you're doing. What do you mean, old man? For God's sake, tell me. If your homecoming is checked by fears like these, yes, I'm afraid that Phoebus might prove right. The murder and the incest? Yes, old man. That is my constant terror. Do you know that all your fears are empty? How is that? If they are father and mother and I their son, because Polybus was no kin to you in blood. What? Was not Polybus my father? No more than I, but just so much. How can my father be my father as much as one that's nothing to me? Neither he nor I begat you. Why then he, did he call me son? A gift he took you from these hands of mine. Aha, from these hands of mine. This is the messenger Jocasta sent out years ago. She doesn't even recognize him. This is the messenger that took the baby, the little baby, and gave him over. And the reason he knows is he was the one. He, this messenger is not, no ordinary messenger. Did he love so much what he took from another's hand? His childlessness before persuaded him. Was I a child you bought or found when I was given to him? On Citheron's slopes, in the twisting thickets, you were found. And why were you a traveler in those parts? Now, Jocasta's sitting here on stage during this. She's silent, but you can imagine her watching. And I don't know how he staged this, but you have her and everybody's looking at her as well. And so she's probably sitting there, and if you're a good actor, can't see her face, I mean, if you could. And she's probably, she's got to indicate in some ways that she's, <laughs> I mean, is she wobbling like this at this stage? Like, what well, on earth? Because she's not speaking anyway. You were a shepherd. A hireling vagrant? Yes, but at least at that time, the man that saved your life, son. What ailed me when you took me in your arms? In that your ankles should be witnesses. Why do you speak of that old pain? I loosed you. The tendons of your feet were pierced and fettered. My swaddling clothes brought me a rare disgrace. So that from this, you're called your present name. So when I said Oedipus, it could be swollen foot. And so that, that's why you're called this. Was this my father's doing or my mother's? For God's sake, tell me. I don't know. But he who gave you to me has more knowledge than I. You yourself did not find me then? You took me from someone else? Yes, from another shepherd. Who was he? Do you know him well enough to tell? He was called Laius's man. You mean the king who reigned here in the old days? Yes, he, he was that man's shepherd. Is he alive still so that I could see him? You who live here would know that best. Do any of you here know of this shepherd whom he speaks about? Okay, so you can see that it's a gradual unveiling and it's just a little bit of information they're going to send for the other shepherd, the one that brought him to. He comes there, he confirms it. Jocasta, who then hears this, knows immediately that it with us. And she tries to discourage Oedipus from learning the truth. And she goes off backstage and kills herself. She can't face the situation that... It, the prophecy has been fulfilled. Oedipus is going to take a little longer. The audience is a slow unveiling of the truth. And yet the truth in this case is so painful that he can't bear it. He doesn't want to look on his kids who are his siblings. And he, the most deplorable man that anyone has ever laid eyes on, he can't even see himself, and he wanders out of the city in exile. It's an extraordinary story. And, it, and, and what's extraordinary is not the story, but the telling of the story, the way it's told in the tragedy is what makes this the great tragedy of the Western tradition, according to Aristotle. And there's, argu there's a good argument to be made. There is none like it. Never has been, and maybe never will be. Does it speak to human nature as we understand it? I think it does. If you have any... Uh, Particularly, I would have thought Christians would strongly agree with the moral view of human beings not knowing actually the full extent of who they are. And that they are capable of a sort of a guilt that they are oblivious to and to some degree complicit in denying. 
they suppress the truth and unrighteousness. But they're without excuse because they know what the truth actually is in some ways, that there is a God. Anyway, I'm going to leave it off with that. Um, next time essays come in, and I think we deal with, do we not deal with Plato's Republic? Your question or a comment? Please. Uh, 